Well, hi everybody. This is Al Spath, your Positive Poker Insider, and today I am a client of uh, Posse 1972, who is taking the Apprentice Coaching Streaming course that we're offering from Positive Poker Insiders. You can see more about that on Facebook or on Twitter. And Ryan is with us today, and I am sitting at the table. The star under my name is not because I am a star; it's because that's to identify the person. Uh, back when I was over with the Harpy Poker, Drush was nice enough to do some setups and give me that star, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, I'll always be indebted to his his training on uh, what he did for me, get me started on the OBS. So, Ryan, it's all yours, and I'll come back in during the big blind. Perfect. Good morning, Al. How are you today? I'm doing good. I've been looking forward to this. Excellent. Um, you know, what, what I want to do is kind of start by just getting a feeling um, in regards to your play. You know, give me some, some background on you. You know, how long have you been playing? Um, you know, what do you see as your, your biggest strengths? Some of you feel like maybe areas of weakness with play. Um, talk to me a little bit about what uh, your background is in regards to poker. Well, you know, being this is the first time I've had a, a coaching lesson online with somebody shadowing me and somebody looking over my shoulder, everything I thought I knew uh, probably goes out the window because I don't know as much. I wouldn't be here asking for your help today or having you shadow me and find out what the leaks or holes in my game are. So um, I would say that my greatest strength is, and I'm, I'm, I'm posting the blind here I, say, I would say my greatest strength is so far has been reading skills on, on trying to put players on hands and then of course um, when the cards are not coming uh, now see I, I'm closing a, a bet here but uh, and it's 10 cents for 55 about uh, five to one but the cards aren't good and I, and I feel that I'm out of position so I, I would fold this hand okay um, no matter what came, even if it was three diamonds or three fours or three nines, I, I would I, myself. I tend to fold there, unless they, you know, it's it's tremendous odds. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think when you're out of position, five was good. Uh, what do you feel about that? So you're sitting there saying that you prefer not to defend your big blinds when what would the odds are in your with the way you say it, five to one there. Yeah, about, I think it was, I think I had to pay 10 cents for 55 cents, about five and a half to one, something like that. Yeah, see, I, I completely disagree. For 10 cents in the pot, uh -huh. um, I think that you need to defend that situation. Otherwise, you're going to be throwing away um, your big blind way too many times, and that's a, a big leak that, that players have is playing out of the small blind and big blind. Um, in that situation, I think there you should have made a call, uh -huh. and then whenever the you know, and then and then reanalyze the play or the the flop and determine what your action is at that point. Okay, I'm folding here. It's a similar situation, but I'm not. Somebody raised on this one. And I was in a small blind out of position, and it was thirty-five cents to call. That's a big difference, yeah, because yeah, sure. you only had, you know, two. You had the the first to act went ahead and raised. Typically, when you're first to act and you raise pretty big, like he did four times the big blind, you have to assume he had a monster hand. Okay, here I've got position. I've got great cards. I'm against two blinds, so I'm going to raise the pot uh, to twenty-five cents. All right, so your preference is to go two and a half percent, two and a half times the big blind for a raise. I found that since I started online at the lower limits and now moved up to the nickel dime limit, that a pot size bet generally seems to be big enough to do what I want it to do. Um, sometimes I will make a, a and I'm going to throw. It, I don't play any two suited cards, even though it's a it's only ten cents. I I, I don't like it. It doesn't make straights and stuff. I normally throw yeah. this away. Yeah, that I think that's a good fold there. So, you know, there are times if the table's very uh, aggressive. If, if I thought like this guy in the big blind who's got all the money here was a calling station, he'd call anything, then I would make the bet 40 or 50 cents. I don't, When I got big cards, I don't want to push people out. I want to keep at least one. Pe there, was only, there was only two people. Even if they both stayed in, I don't really mind that as much as I'd like to get it isolated for one but 
I don't want to make a bet so big that I get no action at all. Okay, so what I'm hearing by you is your bet sizing or the your raise amounts, you're going to um, vary that based on the table play. And at this point of sitting at this table, you felt like the 2.5 was a pretty standard raise. You were going to go ahead and raise that and play from there. If, if you felt like this table was a little bit more of a loose table, then maybe you would go ahead and, and raise differently in this situation. You know, I'm looking at the table that you're playing at, and, you know, I think table selection is a very big part of um, online poker play. You know, you can't go to a casino and take a look at the, the tables and then see what the average pot size is as well as the percentage of people that see in the flop. At the table you're at right now, it's showing that about 23% of the the individuals at the table seeing the flop so what does that tell you right from the beginning well that's and i, I, I let me just talk about this hand i'm in pretty yeah. early position although we're only playing uh the two out two out we're playing six handed i'm inclined to just fold this hand i'd get involved figuring that somebody else back here is going to try to assert their position and i'm i'm left in an early position with a weaker hand and even if they don't and everybody calls when I see the flop hitting the queen or the 10 may not be really that good against somebody else I, I don't they might have a better kicker than me so I, I'm inclined to throw this away but if I was later I would raise with it if I was down yep. in here I would have raised so what, what you're saying here is that you you will play a wider range of cards based on the position you're at, which is good. That's exactly the way you should play. Right. In that situation, you were, what, second to act, and Queen-10 is not a very strong hand in that spot. You make a raise, and Gannick or, or Vanja, Van, Vanna Jr. could have easily raised over top of you, put you in a situation where you're going to have to lay, that card, lay those cards down. Correct. So, you know... Going back to the the table as a whole, you know, I'm seeing this is a, a very tight table when you're only seeing 22, 23 percent of the players making it to the the flop. Yeah, I didn't get back to your question about that. Yeah. Now, see, this guy just limped into me. He could be setting me up, but I don't think so. So my opinion is, and is I need to make this 30 cents and and force him to pay another 20 percent 20 cents out of position i got a, an ace i got a suited hand i gotta think that he's got just about any two cards a wide range here so i i should be in front of him that's my thinking pre-flop now my thinking is you know he's got to have some connection to that but i gotta find out so i would just manage the pot and go 45 cents okay and, to see if, if he stays around then I know he's connected somehow to this pot, and that deuce doesn't help me at all. So I would shut it down here. I don't think I can barrel again and get him out of this. Mm -hmm. That's my I, opinion here. Yep. I, 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 I totally agree. Totally agree with that. You know, if, if you barrel again, more than likely he's setting you up with potentially the flush draw, or he could have easily hit the straight. He could have queen jack on that situation at ace 10. But, you know, he's still, if you would have bet there, he's calling the turn no matter what because he's got the nut flush draw uh -huh. as well as the straight draw. Yeah. I mean, I could have bet the, when he checked the river, I guess I could have bet, but I also could have thought that he was setting me up to, to be a bluff catcher. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, if that's now, if that's the what is that what bluff catcher is where he's got a hand that he knows he can beat if somebody just tries to bluff at it. Is that right? Or is that how, how you say that? Say say that again. A bluff catcher. Can you define what that is? Um, did you know, I, I don't. Did I use it right? I don't. I don't use bluff catcher in in my uh, terminology, so I'm I'm not sure completely how I would say that, how I would use that or how I would answer your question. Okay. Okay. Um, it, I, I I was I was interpreting it as um, a person that that has a hand that that thinks that they can beat the opponent um, by if they bet they're going to win and they're not going to get anything, but they might. If they check, they can get their opponent to to try to bluff at the pot and win. So, you know, I thought he had a better hand there. And if, if he was, in my opinion, if he was a bluff catcher, he was trying to, bluff, you know, to check, hoping I would bet, and then he would, you know, get that money from me. 
So, so what, what you're saying is bluff catcher is basically saying that the only only hand that you're going to be able to beat is a bluff. Well, uh, it's saying you want no. I uh, here I'm on the button, hmm. and we've got you know two limpers in the pot, and I don't want to really limp with this hand. If I play this hand, I want to raise with it, even though it's not the greatest hand. I want to assert myself here and try to get these blinds out. Try to you know. These guys that limped have a, a, a bad range, in my opinion, because they limped. Unless they're trying to trap and come over the top with something big, which some people can do at these levels. They both call. Now, I, I got to follow up without without seeing what they're going to do. I'm going to do a whole full pot bet here because I want to get them out now. If they would have bet, I would have folded. Probably wouldn't have come over the top of them. Because mm -hmm. I have real now you know, again, I have nothing of that. A runner, runner is the only way I can win this. That's that was one of your runners, but you know, are you sitting there feeling like your your draw is strong? I mean, if you hit the five or the the nine, do you think you you just beat beat Tuller? No, I, I don't think I can bet there at all. Mm -hmm. um, and now here's the, the situation where we just talked about, and I'm going to go a little over half the pot to try to see if he's really missed or if it, it's one of those bluff catcher situations in my opinion that he, he's trying to induce me to to bet now if he puts me on ace jack and he doesn't have the flush he's got a fold so see here's what i mean so he had the king and yeah. he wasn't he wasn't going to bet that because i could come over the top of him but he was going to be able to let me bet and take my money do you see what now, i mean yeah, I, I completely understand that. I think you're in a, a position right there where you just got a lot of good information. It cost you some money, but you got a lot of good information on that player. Sure. I think I think I would be taking some notes on him to say, you know, uh, that you know the guy's willing to call almost anything with top pair. There was a flush on the board. You had a uh, two different. You had a straight on the, the board. Therefore, if, if he's calling a king high, you could definitely take that to your advantage later on. So you would you would go in and you'd make a note that this guy is uh, a what? Uh, would you call him? Uh, I'm, I, I don't call him anything right now. You I'm just, just taking. You say I'm, he's just pretty loose? I, I'm just Wide taking range? notes. Yeah, <laughs> saying that, um, you know, he's willing to, um, you know, call down with top pair when there was so many combinations on that board that could beat him. Again, I'm going to go with the pot here because this is a tight table. If I go any higher, I might not get a caller at all. Okay. And I wouldn't mind a caller here. Yeah. This is a premium hand in this position, I feel. It's not a group one hand. I know that, but it mm -hmm. still looks and plays pretty good. Yeah. yeah and in that, in that situation, they folded, yeah. and I'm okay with that. So here I got the same situation, and do I want to make the pot bet again, or do I want to go higher? Um, but I don't think I'll get the action, so I'm going to go with the... Why is this doing 20? It says 20, but it's supposed to be 25. Because uh -huh. when you get a premium hand, again, I want to get action. I don't want to... You know, if somebody has an ace or a king and they beat me, that's so be it. But I got to I gotta try to make some money off of my good cards. I don't get them that often. Well, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, I don't like the idea where you said, you know, that that you're potentially maybe going to raise a little bit higher when you have that premium yeah. hand. That, that's a huge leak. Yeah. If I'm sitting at your table and I see your your bet size is normally two and a half, right. and you're going to turn around and raise it five times right away, that's saying, hey, buddy, I've got a, a premium group one, group two hand here. It's, that so, doesn't say to them that you're trying to protect the weaker hand like pocket eights. Nah, I, no, I, I'm, I don't feel that way at all. I okay. feel like that, uh, you know, they're betting that premium hand. Now, if after you get to the point where you see a showdown and, and the individual's betting like that, then again, I'm taking notes on that person so that you can say later on, all right, the guy raises a lot, lot larger than normal when he's got a mid-range pocket pair. I got it. Um, I, again, for those folks that are joining us, uh, whether you're watching this later on on YouTube on Al Spath, uh, Positive Poker Insider channel up there, or if you're watching it live, uh, Ryan is doing a 
session with me right now and he's doing an apprenticeship in coaching and streaming online and I am a new client who just started moving into the five cent ten cent area so I'm in a small blind here again this is that same guy that that, that came in I'm going to make this 30 cents because that is where I want to be and see what these other two want to come at I can't answer any Skype calls right now if anybody's trying to Skype me. Um, he stayed again, so he could have any ace reg, but I got a fire at him. I think 53 is not enough to find out, so I'm going to do the whole pot. And he called me before I could even get the money in there. In that point, 53 cents, 70 cents is exactly the same bet, in my opinion. You think it, it would have done the same yeah. thing? Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, I can't fire here because of the way he called me there. And now he checks. But remember, he did that exact same thing to you last time when he had top pair on the board, and he set you up. There you go. That's the right move there. Check it. All right. And he should bet out here about a buck ten, buck twenty, right? Uh, he surely. wants to get paid. He's going to bet sixty or seven. <laughs> <laughs> or if he wants pay, get, to get paid, he could bet it that way also. Yeah. Well, that's that's kind of trap to me. That says. Uh, Oh, I'm just going to bully you off of it and make you think I don't have it when I really do have it. Nobody just commits that much money usually without having it, in my that, opinion. It depends on the players. That's where, yeah. you know, I'm a, a strong proponent of taking notes on the players you're playing with. Yeah, this guy here was over here a little while ago. He left. Okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're covering a lot of ground here. I, I appreciate that. I just... It's a lot to take in at one time, so I got to slow it down. That's why I picked the the ten player table, so you and I would have more time to talk. But I could tell you what my thoughts were as a new new client, and you could point out where I'm deficient in. Uh, Absolutely. I see you know, again here. I don't I don't like this hand. I don't like limping here with with this other one guy behind me. If I can raise here and do a pot size bet. And get this guy out, then I got position. That's but then he calls me anyhow. So um, I could have went higher, but I guess I I, I don't no. think I, I want to go higher with a hand like that. No, no, you you don't want to go higher. You know what's the, what's the reason you're raising there? You know you, that's a question you have to ask yourself: is why am I raising this hand? I want to get him out and get position on this guy who limped in with these cards because they're more inferior. So you're looking to thin the field and then get position in this situation. Say, say that again. I was reading the, the chat yeah. from Malengo. Uh, Dave Romer, who's one of our Poker Insiders, came by. He's the uh, lead instructor over at Poker School Online. And he uh, came by to say, uh, wish us well and have a good stream. Thank you, Dave. And Maximus just came in, too. And Noodle the River just came in, too. That's great. Hey, um, guys. Welcome. I, I, yeah, I have overs here, but I can't call this guy. No. No, what what you did was you raised to thin the field uh -huh. and attempt to get position. So you had a reason for your raise, knowing that your hand wasn't a premium hand, but it was a good enough hand to try to to do something to to be able to basically take control of the hand. Right. Um, we we also got a new player uh, that just came in. We hope he sticks around and uh, like Lucky Seven Mario. Here's a hand that. I don't like to play, and one of my coaches once told me, if you if you say I don't like it or it gets in trouble, then throw it away. Yeah, absolutely. It's just it's one of those hands that can win, but it, it really needs a lot of help and stuff like that. For those that are joining us, I'm Al Spath. I'm uh, one of your Poker Insiders here at Positive Poker Insiders, and Posse1972 Ryan is uh, an apprentice streamer coaching program over at Positive Poker Insiders, and this is day one of a five course or a five session course uh, to get him up to speed on coaching and streaming. Although he knows a lot about it and everything, we're going to go through the fine points, and I'm going to be the actor, and I'm going to play the new client and ask questions and and leave things purposely open ended so that he can jump in and finish them up, so that you can hear how. A coach deals with somebody that doesn't know exactly what to do in certain situations without telling them what to do during the hand because we don't want to collude. That's a big thing about this. We 
We want him to make his comments after I act. Yep. And I, that's an easy so, fold. So, you know, when we were talking earlier, you told me your, your reading skills you feel like one of your strengths. You never did tell me one of your weaknesses, or if you did, I didn't. I missed it. Uh, my weakness is... Or area I, improvement, you want to call it. I guess my, my area of improvement would be extracting more value on the river. Okay. Sometimes I don't I, I I don't do the right things there, and for some reason I don't get a caller, or I try to do something silly, and it, it doesn't it just doesn't turn out. So I, I I need some help when we get to I can barrel on the on the mm -hmm. pretty good on the flop and the turn, but then when a river card comes, I. I'm not sure if um, if I should go any further with money or even though I have a good I think I have a read on somebody um, the board sometimes clouds the issue at the end okay that's that's definitely something that that we can work on but in order to to really be able to maximize that value on the river i think that uh, you need to have some additional tools to be used with your your normal play here okay. so that we can go back and analyze that stuff later um you know i noticed that right now you're you're one of the players that's playing without a, a hud right. which is what, okay what are you going to do here i'm going to call I'm gonna okay. check. I'm gonna check. I don't think okay. I should raise. Although at this kind of table, at this low limit, if I raise to fifty cents, I probably get two or three of them to call me, and and I really don't want to call her there. Now I got four four diamonds. Sometimes at these lower limits like this, I always try to assume what would I do if I was at like twenty five cent fifty and everything. Now, and do I, I want I... to make the flush or do I want to you know? And some part of me says to, to, to start to build the pot. All right. I don't you know, know if I, that's right or wrong. I don't, I don't have a problem looking at pot building, but in the same token, you're, you're steering away from your normal betting style. So there could be, you know, the potential of somebody that's watching your play, picking up on that, saying, all right, I'm going to try to, to make some adjustments of, on my play based on what he's doing right now. Well, my, my read here is he got a weak king or he was on a diamond flush himself. And I'm going to bet 93 cents, about half the pot, to find out. Mm -hmm. And him folding that fast, he either had... I don't think he had a, a straight draw because if he had the queen ten, he would have made it with the jack. And if he had the, yeah. the queen jack, he would have had a, a, a jack with a queen kicker. He'd have called me there. So that's where I'm saying that I, I think I read that guy right. I, I, I think he was chasing the flush. And I think I would be taking notes on him right now saying that, you know, he this this player's willing to, um, you know, willing to call half pot bets on a flush draw. I'm out of position. Queen King, I think, is overrated. Um, uh, somebody told me once that you know even a, a rag ace is like two to one against it. So this guy raised, and I'm out of position with this. I, I'm not inclined to call here. I, I don't know what you would do there, but I'm not inclined to, to call. My, my play varies, to be honest. There's, um, I'm not very consistent when it comes down to playing king-queen out of position. Um, I'm going to really analyze the table, and sometimes I'm going to make the call. Sometimes I'm going to raise. Sometimes I'm going to fold. It's just, uh, you know, I, I think that that's more, um, unfortunately, where I, I, I kind of play with, with a gut feeling there or based on the information that I have from the table. Yeah, okay. I can I, and, and those that... Uh, our results oriented would look at that flop and say wow you hit two pair and then turned a, a boat and you would have won everything but I got to go back to what my mentor uh, uh, and one of my fellow uh, coaches uh, Dave Lango um, said that uh, don't be results oriented you don't know what's going to come that could have been just like it was but somebody could have had 10 jack and made a straight too yeah, absolutely. Um, so here, this guy doesn't usually put 20 cents in, so that alerts me that he's got a little better hand. Normally, I would raise here the pot and try to get 
this position dominated with the sevens. I, I don't want to call there uh-huh. uh, and invite these two in, but I think based on him doing what he just did there, he may even come over the top, but he doesn't. But I got to think he's got a big hand here. And seeing so the ace, I, I'm not... You were successful in your goal. You went ahead and eliminated three people from pre-flop being able to see a, see the flop if you would have just called there. Uh, I, I think he's I think he's fooling around here. I don't right, think why, he bets the two dollars. Why Why do you say that? Well, go ahead and what do you, uh, talk I, me I through think, this. I think that he doesn't have the ace here. Then Dave said before that. Uh, he does have the ace, doesn't he? So I can't go any further. Dave said that uh, don't be results only, but he likes to defend with the king queen there. See, I, I I understand where he's coming from, but I just don't value the king queen that much out of position against a razor. I just that's that's a tough one for me. So as a new student, I got to learn when I can do that. And maybe he's saying because we're at these um, lower limits that um, don't give don't give too much credit to the, your opponent and do see a flop. I don't well, know. What do you, you know, think about that? Yeah, no, I, I'm looking at this again saying that this table is super tight. Um, you know, I, I think that in that situation, you didn't have any information on the players that were in that pot. I think it's an okay lay down right there. And, you know, I think it's super, super important to understand results oriented and not look at things like that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, you know, it's see, it's it's interesting because you know we've got Maximus in chat right now saying King Queen 100 percent of the time full the small blind there. Yeah. Yeah, and now Lango's coming back saying you know it depends on the read and if the player is tight folding is fine. In that situation, we don't know the player, but we know the table as a whole. Uh oh, uh oh. Here's notes. This this guy went in 100 percent and he's got the redraw too. I yep. can't see that this guy over here, um, AAD, AAD thing, going in all that money for just pocket eights. I don't understand that. Well, that's where I take a note. I yeah. put it in there and say willing to, to risk his entire stack with uh, pocket eights. Stacks with pocket eights. Yep, good notes to have. And, you know, Lango, Lango mentions that folding 100% of the time is a significant error, and I, I, I totally agree with that. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. There's going to be times that I play that hand. There's going to be times that I raise that hand. There's going to be times that I fold that hand. It's just kind of based on the situation of the table. Yeah, as a new student and, and a new client of yours and, 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 and having somebody look over my shoulder and not knowing – I just feel that I, at this lower limit, and I'm trying to build a bankroll and everything, don't want to put myself into too many situations where I think that I'm the underdog. And so I have a tendency to not play that hand there. I don't know what my thoughts would be if I had a couple hundred dollars in my bankroll and it was up at 25 cent 50. Would I call if that was, I think he went 40 cents, so he went three times the big blind so I don't know if uh, or four times the big blind I think I don't know if I call two dollars out of the out of the small blind with the king queen I, I'm not sure at this point in my development you know one thing that I want to back you up on a little bit I am not a big fan of talking down to a five cent ten cent player um, you know you're you keep saying that if I was playing at a higher stakes I would do this why don't you work on mastering the stakes that you're at and play into your best of your ability you're reading the players you play the players you play the table and you play your cards so don't don't get all um, um, uh, focused in on well if I was playing one dollar two dollar if I was playing you know 50 NL I would play it like this at right. this point, I would play play it based on the information that you've got um, on the, the table. Now, Lango brings up something that I think is definitely a, a good talking point here. And he is saying that if you knew that your player was lag 
or you know what he means by that is loose aggressive, mm -hmm. who's opening a wide range of uh, uh, as wide of range as you know queen eight, then would you still fold king queen? And in that situation that he described right there, if you know your players lag, then no, you don't you don't fold king queen. I I'm personally raising against a loose aggressive player in that situation um and, and i don't care as much about my position in that situation either okay so maybe on one of the other sessions that we have um uh we can put that hold of indicator thing uh, up and you can explain that to me and, and how to use it and what all the terms are and and how it helps for online play yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, because something that I'm seeing right now, I know that we've only played, what, maybe 15, 15 hands or so in this period. Of time. Maybe there's been 20 or so. Mm -hmm. It seems like that you've called a lot, of, a lot of pots or put money into a lot of these pots. Mm -hmm. And that's basically a, a statistic that's looked at is, uh, you know, voluntarily putting money into the pot. And typically, you know, you want to try to keep your, your starting ranges of cards that you're going to play um, to a, a, a certain percentage based on the, the table that you're at. If you're playing a six max game, you know, you want to try to be in a starting range hands of somewhere between, um, you know, maybe 20 and 25 percent of the time you're putting money, in, putting money into the pot. You know, I would say you could probably get as high as maybe 27, 30 percent when you're playing um, – uh, 10 max so you know you definitely want to look at that and make sure that you're uh, narrowing your starting hand ranges um, a good tool to look at also with that is to go out and download flopzilla um, you can download it for free you there's a you know it's a, a free period of time that you can use i want to say maybe it's like a trial period of 30 days or something and then what you can do is you can open a software up and say i want to see what a starting range is if I play 25% of the ha starting hands. And it'll give you a nice color map to say, these are the hands you would be playing if you open 25% of the hands. So it's going to help you then take a look at your play as well as when you start capturing the information on the others at your table that you can say, okay, you know what, that individual likes to play 70% of his hands. 70% of the hands is this many ranges or this many combos, a preflop range, to give you a, uh, the ability to sit back and really analyze what their, what their cards are. Okay, okay. Well, maybe, you know, I'll download it and everything, but the day, maybe not next lesson, because the next lesson, you know, we had, we had discussed about doing something else, but maybe that third session, maybe you can um be at a table that i'm at and and put and share the screen or something so that yeah. we can see what that looks like and then the use of the flopzilla and and explain how the the convert i know that there's a hud and they know that there's a you know poker tracker and i heard about a converter coming in but you can tell me how kind of everything pieces together yeah, absolutely. It's all the tools that are available to you for online play is something that, you know, I would highly recommend. Use what's available to you. You know, you can't walk into your local casino and open up a HUD on your players. You can't, you know, you can't open up Flopzilla and analyze every play whenever you're at the, the casino, but you've got the ability to use those tools when you're playing online. So why not capture that data and use it to your advantage? It's is it more is it more that it's to your advantage or if that you're not using it you're at a disadvantage um i think you could look at it both ways okay. you know i think that you when you're not using it um it's a disadvantage if you've got players at the table that's using it against you and it's an advantage if you're using it because then you can play on the strengths and weaknesses of your players you know an example would be if i'm sitting at this table and i have pocket jacks and i look over at gannick who only puts money into the pot a very small percentage of the time yeah. and he went ahead pre-flop and stuck his entire stack in there i'm gonna fold pocket jacks to gannick where if somebody else like that B taller does that and he's got twelve dollars and pushes his stack, I might call him because I know he's a, a loose aggressive player. So, you know, having information on your players is definitely an advantage. 
But I also want to say that when you have that information on players, sometimes it can steer you in the wrong direction. And let me give you a, a quick example of this. Um, I was playing in a, a, a tournament last night. It was a, a home game. Mm -hmm. There were about 27 players in it, and I, the, I, I get seated at my table. There were three tables, and uh, the table that I had, I was looking around the table and saw that I had probably I would classify out of the seven at my table, there might have been three solid players. I would have definitely said there were four fish at my table also. Um, so, you know, it was a, a table made up of a good solid play as well as some um, uh, fish or fun players, which means they're, you know, they're not as, as strong of a skill set as others. And, you know, we get into a hand where I have ace-jack hearts, and I am one from the button. Blinds are 75, um, 150, and I raise it up to $500. Mm -hmm. I get the, the uh, person next to me folds, button folds, small blind folds, big blind calls. Big blind is a lag player. He's very loose, very, very loose, and very aggressive. Flop comes 9-9 nine, nine, jack. So the, the loose, the loose uh, lag player checks. I bet half pot, and he calls me. He thinks a minute or two, he makes a call, and then uh, the next card comes over, it's an ace. So, you know, I've hit two pairs, but, you know, he's sitting there in the, the big blind, and he checks again, so I come back and I bet half pot a second time, and, uh, you know, he, he calls me. It wasn't a snap call. It was like, you know, it was definitely one of those situations where you see he's thinking a little bit. And then the, the river comes, and it's an ace. So I ended up pulling a boat on the river. I'm sitting there. I'm almost jumping out of my seat saying, holy crap, how can I get all this guy's chips? Mm -hmm. So he checks, and I go ahead and bet half pot, and he shoves the stack without even thinking. He almost, like, jumps out of his chair. So I was like, well, that's interesting. And, you know, I think for a minute, I'm like, well, you know what? I've got the, the top top flush on or the top uh, boat on the board. There's only one hand that could beat me, and that would be pocket nines. It's highly unlikely that he's got pocket nines the way he played that. So I called. Sure enough, he turned over pocket nines. Wow. So that was a situation where that, you know, there might have been other players at that table that were a, more of a solid player. Mm -hmm. I might I might have laid my cards down to them or played a little bit differently with that shove all in. But because I know that individual is a, you know, super loose, aggressive player, I thought he, he missed something or was just, you know, hoping that with the, the two pairs on the board, he could get me out of there, you know, thinking that maybe I have a jack or he had a jack or a nine there. So it's just it's interesting how that works out. So you know you could it, the, the information you collect could hurt you, but I think long term, the more information you have on a player, the better off you are. Well, that's good. I, I think I think uh, the mixing of, of actual stories like that, you know, or not because they're bad beats. I, I I think that people tend to run and talk about bad beats in a, in a, in a wrong negative way. It just doesn't do anything for anybody. But I think talking about how it it worked out and how you had to read and everything is good again we have some new people and i encourage them to uh to follow us here the the poker gun is in right now too and uh must go fishing and uh i'll uh just put something in here real quick in the such and i am playing the student today and ryan which is posse 1972 you see his logo there on the overlay in the bottom left hand corner he's one of our streamers here at positive poker insiders and he's in the apprentice program to become a, a full-time coach and streamer and uh he's got lots of skills and i am playing the new student here as teach as the star on the table indicates for those of you that aren't watching this live and that are up on YouTube I hope you're getting a lot out of this and if there are questions that you want during the sessions moving forward just email them to me at alspath at alspath.com and I'll pass them on to Ryan so that he can pose them to me as we move along uh, again I thank you guys for joining the stream right now and I am the student and Ryan is the streamer and the teacher Good morning, everybody, and welcome, Rob Gag. I see you just joined us. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, 
I, I want to kind of hear right now what your thought process is being in the small blind with a small pocket pair. Well, it, it depends on what the action is in front of me, but mm -hmm. I, I really, you know, want to see a flop here with, with, with pairs. I don't want to pay a hell of a lot. Somebody made it a dollar. I probably am not going to try to set mine and I know I'm going to probably be behind or be in a flip with somebody. So I'm, I'm not going to pay that kind of money. Now, if, if it's up to me here and that same guy limped in here, then I got to think, you know, do I really want to raise it? I know I'm not going to get him out and then I'm going to be out of position and I can't shake him. So maybe it's best for me just to see a flop. I like that, that play quite a bit because you know that he's going to call you. So now you're in a situation. How are you going to react to this? Well, I'm, because the two cards are touching themselves, and I think that people play king 10 and 10 9, there's a possible good straight out there, or even a gut shot straight, and then there's two flush cards. So I'm going to bet two, uh, three quarters of the pot. Okay, which is consistent to your normal betting strategy. And I'm, or hoping betting that, style. I'm hoping that he has queen jack and comes over the top of me. I mean. Uh, that's not a good card for me, but again, no. uh, I, I think that the three-quarter is going to keep him in, but I think if he's got a club, he's going to stay, and I'm going to charge him the full amount to stay if he's got like a king or an ace of clubs. Mm -hmm. The yeah, hard part there... here for me is if he comes over the top, knowing that he possibly has a flush like that, what do I do with the amount of money that I have left? Well, I can't tell you that. You go ahead and make your play, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Yeah, I, I, I tend to think that he's, he's, uh, saying he has a flush, but he doesn't have a flush. He has the queen. Yep. Now, what's interesting is, um, oh, do you realize Rob's saying there's no delay? Yeah, that's because of the Sunday conversation, and <laughs> and, and I put it at zero, but that's okay because. You're not at the table, and none of these guys are at the table, so okay, it's not going to matter. None of these, if anybody like comes to the table from the, this room or something like that, that yeah. would screw up the, the stream. But yeah, I need to adjust it. But Rob's such a party pooper. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the button. I, I'm not facing any raise. I'm going to throw this away. But if I were to try a steal here, I would probably the pot would be 45. I would probably go 60 cents here or something like that. But I'm not in favor of doing that with that kind of... If this was... If it was 4-2 off spades, I'd be more inclined to do it than jack-2 off suit. Why is that? Because then I have some kind of a redraw. In other words, I don't yep. think I, I have a chance of hitting much here. If I hit the jack, I got a bad kicker. I hit the 2, I got the lowest pair. But if I have 2-4 and I catch the 3-5, like that's on the board, I, I pick up a straight draw... Uh, Okay, so what you're doing is you're analyzing your hand yeah. and saying what type of combinations can the board hit that's going to help my hand. The more the more series of combinations that can flop that I can hit, yeah. the higher my chances are down the down the line to win the the pot. And yeah, yeah that, that's that's, a, what that's what I was trying to say as as a, as a new student of camp. I, I I knew what I was thinking, but I didn't know how to say it. And you you put it in the right right way. So thank you I, for those that are listening again up on YouTube or anything. Um, I am teach right here, Al Spath uh, and Ryan uh, Posse 1972 is teaching the class here and I am playing the student in the low limit, 5 cent, 10 cent and hoping to answer his questions and, and add uh, the knowledge that he has to, to my knowledge bank so I can build my bank or I'll move to a higher limit. Now, do me a favor. Open up your notes on Vanna Jr. You had notes on him prior to you and I um, starting. I want to see what, what you what you thought was important to know. Um, in big blind versus small blind, if you limp, he goes all in, limp with a big pair. So I think that when you look at that, those notes are good, strong notes. And something that I like to do is when I sit down at the table, if I, there's, I already have notes on somebody, I'm going to read them. I want to open it up, read them, and get some information and say, okay, I've played with the individual before. I've collected the information. I felt it was important to write it on there. So why not refresh your memory a little bit and take a look at what you have on that player?
Yeah. So I like this hand a lot. And this guy made it 20 cents to come in. And I really, um, I like to make it a pot size bet here. Okay. Um, a lot of people might be limp along with that hand, but I, it doesn't do anything for me. And now I, I know that this guy's got a fairly strong hand, although my note on him says, remember, he will chase anything. Yes. And so I figure he's going to chase here, but I'm going to make it again. A, 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 I'm sorry, a three-quarter size bet because I think that's the it's going to achieve the same amount of of uh, information, and I take it down because only because I was strong pre-flop. I think if I would have limped there, I couldn't do that. Um, you still could have had a possibility of doing that, but what you did was you basically set the table saying, I've got a super strong hand. I raised huge. I did a, a, a three bet over NDE coaster, and I'm saying I, I'm sitting here strong. Omni says I'm on the button. I'm going to call and you know kind of play post-flop and see what happens. Right. So when NDE coaster checked to you, you know, saying that you you were the person that's in the, that wants to control this hand. You're going to go ahead and he wants to see what you're going to do. You came out with a pot size bet. Omni said, I don't have a draw. NDE Coaster said, I missed everything. Therefore, I'm going to fold. So you were able to get away with that. Now, if your starting range is too wide, then you might not be able to get away with those type of things. So you want to make sure that you, you, you narrow that starting range down as well as me, I like to have information on NDE Coaster to know, you know, how, how often is this guy jumping into the um, the big blind? How many times is he putting money into the pot? What's he? What what is uh, the percentage of time he's raising pre-flop to know if he's a tight player, a loose player, etc. To see if I want a three bet or, or four bet an individual. Again, the the you know the HUD can provide those stats for you. Okay, it sounds reasonable to me. That's for sure. I appreciate I appreciate all the knowledge and information you passed to me. It's you know I, I imagine that <clears throat> other people like myself can get into an overall. I'm glad that I read the books that you recommended. I, again, I, I can't remember the titles of the the books or anything, but what you might want to tell people that um, I, I just can't remember on top of my head. I just what do you think is important to when you're starting out to 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 delve into um i think that there are zillions of different styles of learning whenever you're trying to be a poker player um one way is to just sit down and start playing the one cent two cent tables the five cent ten cent ten cent tables until you get comfortable with um, starting your starting ranges, being able to try to put players on hands till you get to the point where you can get to a little bit of um, the more advanced thinking. Um, you know, I, I recommend um, watching videos. I, I love going out to YouTube and, you know, just taking a look at everything that can be available to you out there. Um, you know, I, I liked uh, one of the books that, that I read last year when I was on vacation was uh, uh, Small Stakes, No Limit Hold'em. It was Ed a Miller, Ed Miller book. Yeah, it was an Ed Miller book. Yes. Yep, you know, and, and read that. And it was one of those, you know, I, I went down to the beach with the family, sat down in the chair, opened the book up, and, you know, read a couple chapters. Um, I've also, um, I enjoy reading the, the Daniel Niagru books. He had a, a really good book that was a, a quick read that, you know, I, I, I read during a, a business trip. You know, I, was, I had a two-hour flight somewhere, and, you know, opened the book up, sat down, made it through pretty quickly. I don't remember what the title of that one is, but I can I can get that for you. Um, I also... Is he related to Daniel Negreanu? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't pronounce his name. That's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I, I see. It was uh, um, More Hold'em Wisdom for All Players was, was Ooh, one of... Woo, set, flush. Damn. Kings of the third yeah. place winners. Unbelievable. The gold, the bronze, and the silver medal. Everybody, I can ask anybody out there probably right now, including yourself, can you tell me any silver medal winner in the last Olympics? Any. <laughs> no, I can't. 
<laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I would also encourage. See, a, I don't like this. Uh, a lot of people play these ace very much. If, if I'm back here, I'll, uh, here or on the button, I might go for the steal or something. But I don't play them like in the middle position. Uh, yeah. That, that's exactly right. So what you're saying is your middle position starting hands is going to be narrow or more tight compared to the the button or what cut off kind of in those areas. Correct. Yeah, yeah. That that that's really good to to look at it that's like. That's not being too tight, right? Um, no, I don't think it is. Okay. No. Yeah, it, I think, I'm thinking I'm, I'm kind of like a conservative player, but well, if I got something, I want to be aggressive. And I don't know what you would label that as um, tight aggressive. I, I like to think of myself more of a solid aggressive. I want to play solid hands, good cards, but I want to be aggressive when I play them. I don't know if that's a, a term that you would use. Um, I don't. I, I think that I would be more apt to take a look at a sample size of your play uh -huh. um, data and then categorize you based on that. Because you know you might you might feel like that's what your your table image is. But what's amazing is when you sit down at the table with somebody else, they might not see that as your table image at all. That's you know, as as we've been sitting here watching. I'm looking at your play, and I'm 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 labeling you today as a loose aggressive player. Yeah, you've, I think so. You know, you've been in a lot of pots. You've been aggressive the whole time. You know, which is good. Um, you know, I, I think that you much rather be loose aggressive than loose passive. You know, if you're a, a passive player, you're letting everybody else bet your hands, and you're definitely going to be in a situation where people are going to you know hit their hands, etc. Um, Maximus says. Any tips before moving up to the next limit when your bankroll let to do? For example, 10 no limit to 25, what to expect and how to prepare mentally? Um, I think that those are really good questions. And, you know, one of the um, rules that I like to go by for bankroll management is, you know, I'm looking for about 40 buy ins. Um, for my bankroll to be playing at a, a table. So if I'm playing at a no limit 10 table, I should have $400 worth of buy-ins. But as I say that, I also want to talk bankroll management being very similar to when you're on a diet. You know, you can sit back and work all week long at watching your calories, not eating, you know, eating the right foods, but every once in a while, you need to have a cheat day or a cheat meal and say, you know what, I'm only trying to consume you know, 1,200 calories today, mm -hmm. but today's Sunday, I'm going to go out and have a feast and consume you know, 17, 1,800 calories. I feel it's okay to do the same thing when you're playing poker. In poker side of it, it's going out and taking a shot. You know, so if you're, you're normally playing um, NL10, and you decide one day, you know what, um, I, I'm feeling good, my mind's fresh, I'm going to go ahead and jump out and um, sit down and play a 25 NL game. And when, when doing that, I would also personally incorporate um, probably a, a stop win or stop loss um, play. Um, you know, my normal stakes... What's that? What is, what is a stop win? What, what, what I, the way that I would look at that is if I sit down at a table and I'm going to you know, use a arbitrary number, let's say I double my, my buy-in, okay. um, I'm going to say that when I double my buy-in, I'm going to stop playing at that table and leave. Or Even if it's going good? Very yeah. If that's if that's the goal for that day, then yes. Even if it's going okay. good, I will go ahead and lead. If that's what I'm setting prior to sitting down there, because I'm taking a shot. If I'm sitting there trying to take a shot at it, you know, you you could have a couple different um, theories to that that situation. It's going to vary based on the individual. It's going to be based on you know how important is it for you to be able to refund your bankroll. You know, if you're sitting there and you play out of your limits, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you lose your bankroll, are you in a situation where you can't play poker again, or do you have the funds to be able to deposit more money? So I think that's kind of something you want to look at with that bankroll management also. Now, in regards to, um, you know, how to prepare mentally, 
the biggest thing in my mind is you have to be comfortable sitting down at that table and losing your stack. If you're not comfortable losing your stack, you are going to play too conservative and it's going to present problems as you're sitting playing at the table. Because if I'm sitting at your table, there's a pretty damn good chance that I'm going to be able to Can pick I that up. Can interrupt you a second? This guy posted because he just sat down. This guy limped. Yes. And I'm out of time, so I'm going to make it 50 cents. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger than I normally make it, the 40 cents this time. Not because of the cards, but because of the amount of people that are in here. And this, I, I get a quick call from the chaser here, hmm? and I, got, I figured these two guys would go out. Now, my, my goal here is to make sure he doesn't have an ace, but he, he called me that fast. Uh, I'm thinking that he does, but he may not, and he You're may give it up. Stack. Oh, you took a stab. You wanted to. You got the information you were looking for there. Now, yeah. how are you going to react on the the turn? Well, I, I think he's there. He's there. He either got the ace or he's got the flush, and I'm dead. Yep. So you're you're sitting back saying one of your strengths is your reading skills. Yeah. Therefore, you're putting him on the ace or the flush, saying your sevens are no good. If you hit one of your outs, you still lose. Yeah. So that's the right play, in my opinion. And if that's that, only because I could put the read, because I made the 50-cent bet, and he called so quick, the timing tell on that. To call somebody 50-cent really quick, they probably have big cards or a big ace, and therefore I think that he hit uh, good. Now here, instead of, I'm going to do the 25 cents again, like I normally would do, and there's no small blind, so I've adjusted. I got the call that I wanted from him. I'm gonna now. I'm gonna do the, uh, the. If I do three quarters, uh, I'll bring them along. There's really nothing I have to worry about out there. So I'm gonna do the three quarters here. I'm hoping he doesn't have something like the ace ten here. Now I have a tendency here sometimes to go pot or three quarters to try to ring something up. But again, the board's not as threatening without a flush out there. So I'm going to go to three quarters, hoping he'll stay and hoping he doesn't catch the two pair. Now here's that value thing on the end. I could take the check here, but I don't think he's got the ace queen or the king jack here. So I'm going to bet and hope he pays me off. Um, I feel like you missed a big big hand there also that he you got to put inside of his range he could have had um what three six three i i forget what the board was but he could have flopped the uh straight there also so you i think being in that situation he was the big blind you might want to think about that also as a potential hand that he could have been playing uh i think the flop i can't remember was, it, was one like one three five hit hit control r okay let me fold this hand here yeah Control R. What does that do? And this is going to bring up. Oh, I don't know. Where did it go to? It'll yeah. bring up the, the last hand. There you go. And just go ahead and hit next a few times. Just keep hitting next until you see the flop. One more. Yeah, there see, you go. He would have had to play 3 4. They had to call me 50, the 50 cents. I mean, the 25, right? He, yes, it, he very well could have had that in his range. He right. was the big blind. Right. So, you know, I think that's something you want to consider is not to eliminate that from him uh -huh. in that situation. Yeah. He's He's got $44, so he's got four times everybody else at this table for the buy-in, um, for the starting buy-in. So he might have a looser range in that situation. I got it. I got it. I got it. All righty. Um. Maximus is asking, would you recommend to drop down tables when you are cheating meal for that day? 10 no limit, I'm playing six tables, and for example, 25 NL for four or two tables. Um, yeah, you know, basically what you're doing there is just balancing your range um, for your, your bankroll. You know, if you're going to sit down and play um, a couple tables out of your normal stakes, then yeah, there's nothing wrong with dropping the, the range on the other side to say, you know, it's going to kind of counterbalance my, my play. If I lose a little bit here, I might not lose as much over there or the same on the, the winning side of things. Um, but I want to go back to, to you, Al. You know, yeah. I don't want to 
I don't want to focus on um, you know everything that our our chat's saying. I appreciate all the feedback here, but this session is for you. Okay. And one of the things that Maximus brought up is very important that I think you might overlook. And you said a timing tell. I am not a fan at all of trying to use timing tells when playing online poker. This is a weekend and early position for me. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you said that. Um, you felt like the, the one player snap called you, so he must have a strong hand. I'm going to say that might not be the case completely. He could have been, he could be in a situation where he's playing six different tables, and um, he looked at his hand, and he had a, a decent enough hand to make a call because he was already in a blind, or I think he might have been big blind in that hand. Mm -hmm. So he would went ahead and click on call any and jump to another table. Or if you see him sitting there and the clock is running down on him, that just might mean there's action going on at another table that has his, his attention. Me personally, I would not put too much weight on those timing tells. I haven't played that long as, as a new client and everything, but I, I, I just heard what you said. And you said that if they're playing multi-tables and they have a good hand, they'll hit that call any. And so, therefore, if they call any, it could have been an all-in bet. It could have been a $3 bet. It could have been 50 cents. They're ready to call all-in. Then they have a fairly good hand. So I tend to put anybody that puts that button on or uses that uh, fast motion of having a decent to really good hand. And, therefore, I respect them moving forward. I don't put them on just, you know, like, some people here will play queen seven suited or you know ace deuce i don't put them on the, those kind of ranges if they've got that button set or they're really fast i really feel they have a pair or or high cards i would just i would watch that okay and um maximus no definitely keep keep putting your your comments in there you know they're definitely much appreciated i just want to make sure that you know i'm not coaching you the entire time through this um um session when you know al's our our uh, student for the day but i'll be happy to answer your questions when just you put them in, in. That's right. there. Just work yeah, in. yeah absolutely so yeah i appreciate i appreciate that and did you see that question that ryan asked to get did you did you answer that on the slow play oh, of the no. ace king what are your thoughts on slow playing the ace king all right i hate slow playing um, I'm going to sit back and say that I know that I, I said something to you, Al, in regards to the stakes that you're playing. Uh -huh. In my opinion, when you're playing lower than, let's say, 200 NL, um, you, can't, you can't slow play unless, unless you flopped you know, the nuts. Then maybe in the, based on the right situation. Um, when you're playing at um, anything lower than the, you know, the, the 200 NL, I'm going to make the assumption that I'm playing against players that might not be at that level of thinking that you are when you say that, Rob, and I'm going to try to maximize my value and bet that hand. Because if I'm bluffing um, you know, in that situation or if I've got that, that image, I'm going to play it the exact same way that I would play it if I, if I had something strong. If I, would have, if I checked there on the slow play... I think that could be a quick tell saying, hey, you've got something big. Therefore, I'm going to, you know, go ahead and check it and say, you know, bet into me. I think it's a, a tell. So, no, I'm not a fan of the slow play um, when you're playing the micro stakes games. Oh, no, 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 Maximus, you're fine. You're fine. You're, I, we, I don't feel that you're, you're being selfish at all continue with the questions i just want to say that you know there's going to be some some lag maybe where i won't be answering them right away i appreciate this um i don't like this hand uh i've got a feeling i'm going to be first and i this one is one of those hands that when i raise with it usually causes me some pain but i haven't raised the blinds in a long time, so I'm going to put a steel bet in here. Mm -hmm. I just don't like those hands. I don't like uh, many of them. Yeah, well, you're, you're in a situation there where you're really playing position more so than the hand in that spot. Right. 
and it's I haven't done it too often, so they got to really take it for, you know, that they, he's he's really changed up his style since the, the first 15 minutes. Um, and the results have changed. Uh, I think I was a lot looser earlier on because of the maybe the cards that I was getting, the position I was getting, but the way the cards have been dealt this last half hour, I think I've been in, I've been, a, 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 there was a time I had $10 at the table. I went all the way around the table. I didn't play one hand. So what, what you're saying is you're making adjustments to your play based on your stack size? I'm or making based adjustments on... based on your comments. Ah, okay. Okay. I, not my stack size. I never look at my stack size in that respect. Good. I, the only time I look at my stack size is when usually when I'm set mining or something like that. I want to know how much money I have and I want to know what opponents have. Uh, that's the biggest time. And, and, and against, if I've got a hand here, let's say, and I raise, then I'm looking at the stack size of my opponents and I'm looking at what the likelihood of this guy here that's blinking now, Phil, he's got $2 and this guy up here with $2. These are the guys, and Brady's down to 349 These are the guys that, that are going to you know, get in cheap and try to jam if they hit anything or, uh, and I just want to make sure that I'm aware of those kind of guys at the table. Right. Whenever you make a, a preflop raise of say 40 cents, right. they're sitting back saying, well, wait a minute, that's only, you know, one fifth of my stack. I might as well jam. Right. Correct. Or, you know, wait and see the flop and jam no matter what playing short stack poker against you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, I think that's that's strong, as well as, you know, when you've got a, a sub-marginal hand and you decide to four-bet somebody, I think I'm going to, you know, think twice about four-betting Van, Vanna Jr., who's got $50 in front of him, you know, if it's just a sub-marginal hand. I understand. See, now there's exactly what I just talked about. Yeah. Here's a guy, the short stack, wants to just take a flip with somebody. He might have sevens, but he might have ace-jack. But somebody that calls him should have a good hand because he doesn't have nothing. He's, he's not bluffing to win. So and here's the other guy going right back. And so <laughs> the two guys, I, I my reading skills we just pointed that out as I mentioned earlier. So here we go. And this is not good, and this is not good to go all in on. You would think yeah. that this guy would have sixes or better, or this guy here would have to call would have something better. But because they're so short. My opinion is the fact that they're willing to take that crazy flip. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, you notice the comments by Love Labs. Dumb and dumber is what he put in there. And I think that's a great way to describe what, what you just saw. Short mm -hmm. stacks, there's like, hey, you know what? I'm willing to go ahead and take a flip here for the $2 that I have in play. Space Ape is in. He just came in here, so he hasn't been in for the the whole yep. session so let me just go over what we're doing here uh space today is a training session for ryan who's posse 1972 he's in the new apprentice coaching program that we're offering over at, uh, positive poker insiders and so he's coaching me as i would be a new client uh at the table um, as for me i don't play multiple tables because most of the time i'm teaching here i've going to continuation bet and three-quarter bet it, like you said before, whether I do 75 or 56, I'm going to find out the same information. Um, he's going to fold, and Taco Bill's going to stick around. Now, that's a perfect card for me uh, in that if he's on the drawer, he has the ace, he's going to stay around, but I don't want to put him out of his misery here. So I'm going to go back just to do the three-quarter bet, and if he makes the flush, he makes the flush. Yep. Bad card for me. Good card for him. Now, this is the situation you were talking about earlier for an area of improvement, possibly. Yeah. Do I lose the 217? Do I believe him that he was, that my read was right, that he was on the drawer? Or do I think he has something like Ace Jack and I have him beat? And because it's only 217, I'm not going to raise him, but I am going to call him and, and look, look him up because guys down at this level sometimes won't do it. But he had the nuts. Yeah, and that that's perfectly fine the way you played that. I am not going to fold my set there to that guy in that situation. I'm going to you know check call unless he shoves his whole stack. 
then maybe it's a little bit different. But for a half pot size bet, or a little bit less than half, I think it was, um, what he was doing was really betting for value. You know, he was he was trying to maximize the amount of money he was going to be able to get out of having the nut flush draw. So, you know, hook, line, and sinker, you bet because you had a strong hand. But in that situation, I'm completely fine with that play. You yeah, didn't lose uh your stack. You could have easily lost your stack. Sure, you were sure. you were aware that there was a potential straight draw on the board, a flush draw on the board, so you didn't re-raise them. No matter what you re-raise, you're going to lose. He's only going to call if you have a if with a better hand than what you have, um, unless you've got a read on him where you felt like he had the straight and you were going to try to bluff the flush. But you know, you I think you lost the minimum amount you could on that hand. Yeah. The other thing is, if I would have made a bigger, I, sometimes I like to go back and analyze. You know how could I have played this different? I think on the fl uh, on the flop, even if I make a bigger bet, he still stays. He hit the yeah. ace and he's got the four flush. If I make a bigger bet on a turn, he still has the ace and the four flush. Yeah, he's gonna. And then I have to make a bigger call because he's gonna make a bigger bet on the river and I'm gonna lose more money. So I think if I analyze it back, I lost the minimum. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. He's not going anywhere. You know, top ace, top kicker okay. with a Here, the nut here's flush the thing draw. where it's cost me a nickel. For 35, and I'm getting 7 to 1 on my money, and I put the nickel in with any two cards here, hoping that I hit something. I, I don't like that play at all. Okay, why? I don't I don't like making a call from the small blind when you're in that situation. Uh -huh. You either fold or raise. Okay. You know, I feel like, because look, now you made the call, so Vanna, Vanna Jr. says, well, wait a minute, I want to take control of this pot, uh -huh. and, or control of the hand, and thin the field down. Oh. So he made the raise, took over control, which you might have been able to do with a raise there. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, so that's raise that's or fold. A good point that came up. That's a good teaching point for for somebody else that's looking in. That's I'm glad that that that, that came in. Um, here I'm on the button again. I, and I remember we talked about the queen ten in early position. It wasn't suited, and I didn't like it. But on the yep. button, I feel it's well well within the ranges and strong enough to to make a raise to this guy here. Absolutely. Uh, welcome, Space Ape. I hope you're following us here. Um, I don't remember how often uh, I've seen you here, but uh, just if you haven't followed us or tell some friends to come follow us, uh, Ryan Posse 1972. Now, this hand, I'm going to fold it here. If it was suited, I might do something with it, but got a couple of people left to act. I got a new person at the table based on what you said earlier. I got notes, really is a bluffer and stupid. Uh, <laughs> Those are great notes. <laughs> uh, so, um, and oh, I didn't play the seven. No, eight. no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I'm just saying, as, as a new client would say, uh, <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, look at no, all the money I lost. You're being results oriented, something that we talked about very early on yeah. in this stream. You sure. know, seven, eight is a losing hand majority of the time. Lay yes. it down. Yep. Yeah. Especially when you're limping with it, something like that. Yeah. And now you look at the possibility of a full house, the possibility of a flush or straight flush. There's yeah. all kinds of possibilities that can beat a straight out there. And three sevens. Absolutely. And none of it happened. <laughs> High guard wins. <laughs> <laughs> That's so be it. So be it. So be it. So. You know, you mentioned that re reading your opponents is one of your um, strengths. Why why do you feel that way? Or how do you come to that conclusion? Because I, I watched a lot of videos. There's a guy named Al Spath up on uh, YouTube. <laughs> He's got about 170 of them that are free. And he goes through with a lot of different clients. And he shows you how to read and put players on hand. And then, then to... Um, eliminate types of hands in other words he doesn't believe you put a person on one hand um, mm -hmm. uh, you put a person on many different hands in a group like three or maybe even four sometimes it might be like an ace queen uh, pocket pair of nines uh, and maybe king queen suited and and then as the flop goes and the betting goes then you can if you're working on that premise that these are the type of hands that they would play based on their bet and what the texture of the flop is you can eliminate some of them and hopefully you can isolate down to your right on the person's hand. That's and I watch Negranu a lot on TV and I watch him in videos and I study him a lot and I, I listen to his analyzation, not 
the not so the the craziness that that happens in some of these pro games and everything because I think that's a little out of reality in some cases they're more theatrical for the you know they want to make these big pots and they want to make these crazy things for the TV screen and but I look at his analysis and and when he knows he's beat and when he knows that he needs help to get there you know he knows he's behind yeah abs- absolutely so it you know, it, it sounds like, hey, thank you very much, Space Safe, for following both, uh, you know, our, our PPI site as well as myself. I appreciate that. Yeah, we need to add that. We need to add a link um, up, up that comes up here that to, to follow not only you, but to, to Dave Rome or the Lango, you know, that um, you'll be, although you'll be doing some streams here, you'll still be doing streams on your own channels. And so we want to make pe- people aware that they can follow it multiple places because, well, I hope to add additional streamers. I know that Donna Blevins the other day, who's a pro player down in Florida, she's writing a book and her uh, mindset book will be out just before the uh, World Series of Poker. And then she'll be joining us and, and learning how to stream as well. Uh, <laughs> Rob Gag asked a question. You can read that one, Ryan. <laughs> Um, yeah, Rob says, if you know that Al Spath guy, can you ask him to do some specific videos on post-flop play? Uh, I had a me- I got a, a CNN message, one of those scrolls that came across the screen that he, he's going to do that, but he's going to ban Rob Gag from watching it. <laughs> um, Space, to, to answer your question, you know, Space is asking, both of you play professionally? Question mark. Go ahead, Al. You can. We'll start with you on that. Sure. No, I don't play professionally. If I, I consider anybody that plays professionally is making the mortgage payment and uh, making their bones doing that. I play a little bit online and I play live uh, at local casinos here in Maryland and Atlantic City, sometimes in Vegas, but I haven't traveled in a while, some health issues. Uh, but I mostly concentrate on teaching. I take uh, clients on online and. Hopefully they'll turn uh, into great players and make lots of money. But no, I'm not a professional in any sense. Uh, I'm a I'm a teacher that plays poker or a coach that plays poker, and not a poker player that coaches. Yeah, in space. In regards to me, you know, I've been playing poker now for probably 20, 25 years, and you know, I I was more of one of those very low level players and fell into quite a few of the beginner traps where I was, you know, playing any two cards that I would receive and and hold them. I didn't um, think at a higher. Can I interrupt level. you for just a second? Fire. I yes. don't particularly think this is strong, but at this level, it's it's. It's strong, and normally the pot size bet is all I want to invest in this. I don't want to show them the strength of my hand by making it bigger or something like that. But I really keep in mind when I play this in early position that it it rarely is the top hand at the table, but I want to indicate or project that it is. Yeah, I think Ace Jack suited from early positions definitely a, a good starting raise hand, um, knowing that. Ace King beats you. Ace Queen beats you. You're not getting caught up on if that Ace flops. You know, just kind of take a, a stab and see how how it plays. I think that if you fold that from early position, that would be a, a leak long term for you. So I checked here with the intentions of check raising to make like I really hit the King, and I'm going to hope that he didn't and he falls for it. Now he calls there. And I think that he picked up a draw. I'm hoping that he didn't hit the king with a king queen or something, you know, like an, an ace king. I think ace king he would have fired. So I'm going to bet again here and see if I'm right or wrong. So he goes over the top and he's saying he's got the seven or he's got the king and something else. So. It, it cost me a dollar ninety-eight to find out, and I think it's worth the information. You absolutely have to call. Yes, it, yeah, that's exactly the way you look at that. It was a, it was two dollars into a what, fifteen dollar pot, fourteen dollar yes. pot. Yes. So it's worth making the two dollar call, even if you think you're beat. 
to get the information you need in regards to that play. So I analyze that the right way? Absolutely, and yes. Did you like the, 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 was it appropriate for me for, to try to check grades knowing that he probably didn't have the seven to begin with and he was trying to just make like he did and so that I tried to come back and say, I'm not afraid of that? Yeah, I, I think that's okay because of the position that he was at. You came out and raised first to act. Um, it's going to be unlike, highly unlikely that he's going to be calling with a seven in his hand there. You, the only hands that I think I'd put him on is maybe if he had a suited seven, maybe that you know suited connectors he's going to call there. Maybe if he's a, a real rag, then you know maybe he'll play a seven, something like that where it would hit. But yeah, I think it's okay to go ahead and make that play like that. You know, you're representing a strong hand when you're raising first to act, so you're basically saying to to eight and R A, hey, I've got the king here what do you think you're doing right i'm going to take my auto post off now because uh, mm -hmm. although we we try to schedule this for an hour like most of my training sessions um i go over and it's that's that's at my expense and it's at your expense for the time so i don't want to abuse it or anything so uh and i wanted to keep the the video definitely under 90 minutes if not uh shorter than that because uh, we're going to put it up on the YouTube channel for everybody. Here again, you know, you don't like the limp and you like the raising from it, but I really don't like this one as a, as a raising one. And so, again, here's my tendency here is to, to call. And you're saying that's wrong? I, I, don't, I don't like that call. I think in, that, in, in this situation, you either raise or fold for me. Okay. You know, you raise the hand and you've got a, a you know a nice situation here so now you're taking the the stance that you're going to slow play this to allow either the players to get to the flush or were you saying i'm going to give you enough rope to hang yourself what uh, what was your reason for checking both okay and i'm still only calling and for the diamond on the end you know, I'm um, SOL, but I didn't have that much invest in it. And I want to give him a chance to bet this. Somebody told me it's BYOB at the end. I, I <laughs> felt that I was ahead there. But somebody told me, I think it was Rob Gag, to BYOB, which is uh, bring your own bet. Don't yeah. wait on somebody else to bet it there. And yeah. I think he probably had like an ace of diamonds. And he just wanted to make uh, me quit, and he had to redraw. I, that's what my read on it was. But it screwed up, and, and sometimes I find myself doing that at these lower limits, is given these players that I'm playing, uh, this is a raise, and I'm on the button, and I don't like the hand. It's an easy fold for me. Too much, um, sometimes giving them too much credit, and then sometimes trying to try a tricky play, and they don't understand a tricky play, and they don't fall for it, and I don't get them to bet, and I don't get to come over the top of them. Yeah, so what, what you're saying is you find yourself from time to time playing in games where your level of thinking is much higher than theirs. You're at a different level than they are, and that's causing potentially a leak in your play where you're not getting the maximum value out of your hand. Yes, yes. All right. Um, uh, yeah, Space Ape. You know, I, I I was at a point where I was playing any two any two cards for a while. Um, I would say within the last two years to year and a half, I really started doing a lot of studying of my play and really looking to be able to take it to another level. Um, I play quite a bit of poker at the local casino. Um, I'm in a couple clubs that I play in as well as online poker, and I am not a professional. Um, my goal is just to, to have fun with it but definitely play at a higher level than, than other individuals. Um, I was lucky enough to be a, a participant on a quote-unquote game show um, on Poker on Air that allowed me to play in a 12-week session, and you receive point. Yep, that's a, that's a good play there with that big raise, where, you were able, where I was able to get points based off of um, play each week out of uh, nine players. 
And after the 12 week session, the person with the most points, um, they were going to, the, the group was, or the, the group, the, the owner of this uh, facility was going to provide a, a prize pool of $1,500 to get into one of the WSOP events this year, as well as a um, $1,000 travel money. And I ended up winning the, the sit and go 12 week session. So I plan on attending my first World Series um, event this summer. Um, you know, I'm looking at um, a couple of the, the events out there uh, in Vegas for the, the, the No Limit Hold and Play. So I, I would say that I'm not a, um, I wouldn't say I'm a beginner, but I think that I've got a, a ton to learn. And I do feel like when I'm sitting at the table, there's times that I am the fish. And there's other times that I look around the table and say, I'm the, the, the premium player at this table. I've got a lot to learn and plan on uh, you know, learning quite a bit over the, the, the next few years. You gonna sell any part of you because maybe you you know going out there the expense of everything you might sell twenty five percent of you in tournaments and stuff will people have a chance to do that if they pay up front? Well, you know what, um, I didn't think about that seeing that it's basically a free roll for me, but it's definitely something that I'd like to to maybe discuss with somebody that's got a little bit more knowledge in that area because then that would allow me to be able to have you know a little bit little bit of a bigger bankroll to take some of that money and play elsewhere. You know, the nice thing about the, the league play that I, that I was in, all right, how are you going to play this? I'm going to bet it just like I've been betting at three quarters. If he goes away, he goes away. I don't have a flush. I'll have yeah. a draw. Yeah, but you're, you're, you're betting to the drush the 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 drush you're betting to the the nut flush there so you're comfortable at throwing money into the pot because um you know you feel like that uh long term the pot's going to be worth getting in getting your money into in that situation so you're you're playing the draw but you know you could hit the a's and that could also be a, a premium hand against taco bell so what i was saying i i had the pleasure of um, you know, winning that that play, and there's no nothing I have to give back to the group. A lot of those clubs that you get into, you know, whoever they send out there, they uh, ten ten percent, twenty percent, something like that has to be given back to um, the the group. So I'm in a situation where I could definitely sell a piece of myself for that. All right, so we've got what maybe th two, two, three more hands. Maybe, leave maybe one or two, yeah. But then we can. Okay. I'll, I'll sit out and you can wrap up the session for everybody, and then uh, I'll end the video. How's that sound? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Rob, I agree. <laughs> Flush, Drew, shits in. They're right there next to each other, aren't they? <laughs> Yeah, you know, Space Ape, I think that's the biggest thing any poker player can learn is you're never done learning in this game. If you get to the point where you feel like you don't need to, to learn or change your play, then you're going to get stale and the game's going to pass you up. Um, you know, somebody like Al, who's got quite a bit of experience in this game, I'm pretty sure that he sees styles of play today that is completely different than Styles when he first started playing. Very similar to the way clothing comes in, fas in fashion, comes in and out over years of time. Eventually, it all kind of circles back around, which I think happens also in the, the poker community. I'm seeing like right now, one of the big trends at where, where I play at is um, when you're first to act, you limp with a monster hand. It seems like that's huge. Everybody does that now. Um, that might not have been the, the, the style of play five years ago. Um, I'm sitting out for the next hand. I'm just typing something up for people in chat here. And uh, I'd like to just thank you before you give your final comments here for the session. I appreciate it. we covered a lot of ground today. It's, it's amazing how much stuff you can do and uh i guess we've been on on the air for about an hour and a half maybe a little less because we came on skype to get a setup but uh thank you and and you got any uh follow-up on that 
Yeah, you know, I, I want to say I think that uh, today's session was a, a good session. We did definitely talk about a lot of different things. Um, you know, I think that we walked away being able to say we've learned a little bit from each other through this process. And I think one of the, the nicest things is, you know, you were able to, to play at this limit and walk away being up for the day. You know, there's nothing better than being able to learn a little bit as well as win when you're playing at the table. So, you know, very nice job there. Um, I like the fact that, you know, you do follow your gut whenever you have a read on somebody. Um, Personally, I look at that as I don't I don't want to I don't want to say it's, you know, following your gut as much as your experience. You know, you've got the experience, you've seen so much play that you're making an educated decision based on many of things you've seen in the past. And that's important to do. You're you're taking all your knowledge and applying it to the players at this table. Um, moving forward, I definitely think we need to to focus on getting you some of the tools that you need to be able to play um, this game a little bit more effectively when you're playing online. You know, get some of the HUDs up, sit down and go through a little bit of Flopzilla. And what will be even stronger for you as a player is once you start capturing data, we can then go back into Hold a Manager 2 and re revisit hands that you have played when I'm not standing over your shoulder and kind of talk through mm -hmm. your process mm -hmm. and, you know, take a look a little bit more at um, your style of play based off of that. That's where we will really get our bang for our buck to ensure that you can, um, you know, extend the amount of money you're making on the river, um, you know, as one of the areas you feel is a weakness. That's very good. Now, let me put on the trainer hat for a second. And yep. I thought it was an excellent presentation on your part. I think you covered many aspects of it. I think you corrected items that I purposely on times and, and sometimes not purposely um, try to put in the scenario for those that are watching and learning up at the uh, YouTube channel, Al Spath, uh, Positive Poker Insiders. We're trying to be positive here. I think that your approach was positive. I think your tenor was positive. I think your tone was positive. I think your uh, message was positive. I think those that were watching were, were learning. I think those were posing questions were getting good uh, bona fide examples and uh, correct decisions by, by you on what to tell them. I think that those that, that will watch this will, will, will enter the program similar to this if they feel that they've got the skills. I felt that you were qualified to be at this stage and to go through this program. I think there are other people out there that may think they're ready for it, but they got to fill the time. There's an hour, hour and 20 minutes to fill, and it can't be filled by the student who, in some cases, don't pose the questions or have the knowledge or experience that I have. I tried to keep it filled up, and you carry the torch most of the time. So if there's another individual that's out there that can't do that with a client, then they need to work on those skills and we're going to work on more skills. But I'll ask you one question before we do leave and it's always positive to leave with, even though I reloaded $4 twice, you know, so don't think I won so much money, folks. I did reload some, some money, but that was when I was playing a different style early on because I wanted the correction, which I got the guidance from the instructor, which I was seeking. And so, but I'd like to ask you this question. If you had to do it over again, is there anything that comes to mind that we didn't cover that you wished we had time for, or it, maybe it didn't come up and we can do it on a future session? Um, no, I, I, I personally don't feel that way. I, when, you know, when you're sitting down at a 90 minute class, like we just went through, I don't think you want to throw every piece of knowledge you have onto a student during that time frame. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel like, you know, based on the hands that we saw, the situations that came up, I think that it was a, 
a good solid session without overwhelming you as the student to to walk away and say, oh my God, what did I just go through? There was so much going on there that I'm not going to be able to retain that. The idea is, in my mind, is to focus on a couple areas and really work on improving those skill sets so that you can see a change. You know, looking at your biggest leak and try to close that right away. That's where we're going to get our biggest bang for our buck in a short session like this. Over time, that's when we start looking at your smaller leaks and start plugging those holes over time. So yeah, I don't I don't think there is anything that I would like to 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 do diff well, one thing that I do not in regards to you, but in regards to um, one of the comments that I made to the, the the viewers. You know, it's very hard to get viewers on Twitch and to keep them happy. Mm-hmm. And I feel like maybe I came down a little bit hard on space. I think it was a space ape when oh. I said, no, no, Maximus. Max was, when I told Maximus, Mad, Mad hey, Max, Mad Max. Yeah, when I said, hey, you know what, you need to, 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 to slow down just a little bit. I'm, I'm spending more time coaching you than, than uh, Al. <laughs> I think that might have been a little harsh, and I, I didn't mean to, to say it like that. It just came out a little bit wrong. So, yeah, that might be the only thing that I would do differently um, if I redid this stream. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody again for listening in to Positive Poker uh insiders uh, i'm here again with posse 1972 rob uh, ryan excuse me not rob rob's the the the, uh, the thorn in our side over there in the chat um i'm al spath uh, but ryan was the instructor today and he's going through the program he's going through the a- apprentice program to be a, a coach and uh a, a full-time streamer uh not only on positive poker insiders but over on his channel which is posse 1972 so a big shout out to him and please follow him over there because he's going to be awesome when we get through this program and we we cover many more facets uh, as we go along and if you need an overlay and you need some streaming help uh, he's the guy to talk to too that's posse 1972 you can find him on twitch and send him a message um I'm Al Spath. Thank you for your time today. And tell all the people about the Al Spath channel up on YouTube and also our Sunday conversation. This Sunday is going to be really special. Let me tell you, we're going to have on um, uh, Tudor, Stefan Tudor, and he's known as uh, Scrimitzu. It's a C S C R I M I T Z U. And he does four to six channels at one time. He's got over 2,500 followers on Twitch. And I was on his channel the last couple of days, a couple of times. We were talking back and forth. He's looking forward to it. He wants to see what kind of questions I have for him. Some people already submitted questions via email to me, and I posed one of them to him on his channel earlier this morning. And he, he kind of scratched his head and said, uh-oh, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of deep stuff, you know. The question was, how is poker uh, translated to helping him in other parts of his life? And so he had to think about that for a little while. So anyhow, uh, Posse, they're asking when you'll be streaming. I don't know if you've got a stream coming up here in an hour or so, but let them know. Uh, But you can always check Posse1972. Thanks, everybody. Al Spath, and I'm out till the next time, and we'll continue this uh, string of training sessions. Thank you.